welcome to Recovering Your Voice. My name is Bonnie. I'm Caroline. And I'm Colette. And some of you may have seen the opening that this is about love or about Valentine's Day. And you may have said, I'm not watching. I'm going to turn this off today. We want to speak to you first. God, in his most powerful way, demonstrated love. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved. God loves you wherever you're at. And if you want to put aside and forget this day, February 14th, that we're celebrating, that's okay. People hurt. People can be nasty. The world can be a dark place. But we want to speak life into you today. We want to speak love into you. Love that goes across the internet, goes across from our hearts, right into your home, wherever you are. You are loved. You are special because God made you special. And it doesn't matter if you have a special someone in your life or not. You are loved. On a personal note, Recovering Your Voice's episode today is dedicated to each of our husbands. We want to say a special thank you to you for allowing us, giving us the grace to take the time and do Recovering Your Voice. It does sacrifice some time away from our husbands, and we just want to say thank you on this day. Before we begin today with some examples of people who have shown love in our lives, we would like to give you some background on the love languages, and Colette's going to do that. What is it all about, Colette, and uh, why should we be thinking about it? Why should we be have some knowledge in this area? I believe that looking at Gary Chapman's five love language can change your relationship, not just your husband's, but every relationship that you encounter, be it in family, friends, whatever. And um, it changed me. It changed how I interacted with people. When I first met my husband, Danielle, um, he could hardly speak English. And I definitely could not speak French. Oh, what confusions we had. And we that's when we learned to put it through our love filters, to, to look and think of what the best thing they would have intended and choose to believe that's what they're saying, or he's saying, or she's saying. But it was very interesting that we, we didn't have that basis of the communication. It's the same with the five love languages that before we knew this, I only started learning about this. Maybe we were about 15 years into our marriage and it changed us. It changed us completely because I was talking a different love language than my husband was talking and he couldn't understand me and I couldn't understand him just like the French and English. So we have to learn each other's love language and there's five love languages. I'm going to be looking at notes, words of affirmation quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. And we are going to be trying to give some examples to you today and wanting you to maybe see yourself in it first and see those around you. And if you go, oh, that's so-and-so, maybe make some notes so you can go back on it. If I remember correctly, the questionnaire, um, encourages you, I believe, to think about uh, what was important to you as a child, because that might help people to uh, understand more what their, their main love language is. Uh, I think that as we mature, we become a little more um, balanced, even, right? Um so possibly it's not quite as evident to us as when we were children. So encourage people to think back 
to what was really important to them when they were small. I have a very humorous um, story about my sister and I um, trying to show love to each other. <laughs> but it kind of demonstrates that. So when my sister and I were very young, I'm talking under five years old. I remember one Christmas where a mom and dad took each of us to the local store. Now, at this time, we lived in a very small community. There was only one store that you did all your shopping. And it was, you know, kind of like the neighborhood um, variety store, general store, hardware store, everything into one. And so that's where mom took my sister and dad took me on separate occasions to go and buy a gift for each other. Well, Christmas morning came and the, tr the tree was loaded with gifts, but we both wanted to go and get the gift that we had given to each other. Sounds wonderful and warm and beautiful, doesn't it? So we have our gifts in front of us and uh, she opens mine, I open hers, and I had given her what I wanted and she had given me what she wanted. <laughs> And that was the extent of our love to each other on that Christmas. <laughs> Bonnie, I totally hear what you're saying. Because if we're not knowing each other's love language and not knowing how to flow to read each other's language, we are going to do this. And I have an example of this too. When my birthday and a while ago had come and uh, my mom bought me a beautiful mirror with these cherubins beside it an antique mirror like just beautiful and she sent it through her husband Omi my stepdad Omi because she had appointments and stuff and when it came and Omi came it was beautiful guys it was absolutely beautiful but my heart was broken my heart was broken because one of my languages quality time and I was reading the love through my language and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And oh, just side note, when he speaks to me, I'm not telling audible. I hear it in my heart, guys. OK, I'm not hearing voices. I hear it in my heart. OK, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Colette, what is your mother's love language? And my mother was always about gifts always about gifts, giving, 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 giving. And I went, oh my gosh, she just shouted and screamed, I love you. And it totally changed my heart posture. And that's how important it is to learn each other's love languages. So offenses cannot happen. Or when you need to reach somebody, speak their language, speak their language so you can reach them in a deeper level. Well, that, that just prompted me to think about um, a story when my mom gave gifts to my sister and I, and we were, you know, older, we were married, we were, um, I think I must have been in my 30s or maybe even my 40s when she gave my sister and I each a coat. And um, my sister got this beautiful tailored made leather jacket from her and to me it looked sophisticated and it looked very elegant and you know very very um chic my mom gave me this great big furry coat it was large when you put it on i thought i looked like a marshmallow with it on it was blue and white and furry and I was very offended. I didn't tell my mom at the time, but I never wore that coat because I thought it made me look very fat. And I was hurt by her giving me that. And, you know, she had given my sister this very elegant, very cheap coat that you could wear out in public, you know. And then I looked at mine and thought, I look like the abominable snowman going out on that. Well, I learned quite some time later after I had 
nursed some offense in my own heart about this. And why did she give me this coat that looked so fat on me? And uh, her heart was, Bonnie, you live up in Northern Ontario and you need a nice warm coat. And I thought that coat would keep you warm and safe. My heart melted when I heard that. And I no longer had the coat. I had given it away because I hated it so much. But that was a real lesson to me about checking the heart motive behind things. And as Colette said, and how she realized with her mom, that was her mom's gift to her. It was her language. I needed to look at the motive behind my mom giving me this coat and the motive behind giving my sister hers. So a lesson was learned by me at that time. While preparing for this show uh, today, I got in my spirit, what blesses us or wounds us the most is probably our love language. So as we share stories, if you get like, oh, I'm melting, you might want to look under that category. Or if you get like, ouch, I remember when somebody did that to me, you might want to look under that category too. This is about discovering your love language first so you can flow in it. And then as you learn your language, you can flow in other languages. My husband's love language is touch. Uh, and mine isn't. Mine is quality time. Um, but years ago when we were first married uh, and before uh, we both uh, gave our hearts to the Lord and and uh, came to understand more about focusing on each other and love and all of that. Um, I think that it was more evident that his love language was touch and mine wasn't because uh, we didn't have a wonderful, you know, they lived happily ever after thing. We had to work at our relationship and um, in working on our relationship, um, I needed some healing because of um, some things that went wrong in my younger years that uh, made me physically almost flinch at touch. So I had to pursue working at healing for me in order to respond appropriately um, with touch for my husband. And one of the things that I learned when we were working on our relationship, we read um, a book together, and I don't even remember the name or the author to tell you. Uh, it was an old book. But she said in that book that uh, most men don't even believe that they are being loved if they are not being loved physically. So in a marriage, physical love is critical. So um, I learned that I received healing and it became one of the um, areas that between my husband and I, we realize that that's um, an area where we overcame and, um, you know, we genuinely are able to fill one another's, this author referred to it as love tanks, that um, when your tanks, it's like gasoline tanks, when you need love, your when your love has gone low, and you need to be filled up again, then you're looking primarily for your love language to be filled up. So for my husband, and this author said, many um, men in their relationship, they're looking in order to feel loved, 
they're looking for physical love. So that's how they understand. They are receiving and being loved. Uh, so, and in order for me to love him, then I use his primary love language. And Carol Ann, would he then in turn use your love language to demonstrate his love to you? Absolutely. He, mine is quality time. So he will frequently take me out to dinner or um, take me someplace down south uh, to a resort so we can have time together. He will um, even encourage me to uh, take visits to see my sister at home, because in a similar way, I need quality time with my siblings, and I need quality time with my children. He understands that, and he gives that to me. So we've learned this lesson really well. But I also love to tease him, uh, because when we were uh, not yet married, um, he, our first date, he had given me uh, a clada ring. Uh, and that uh, he didn't understand the significance of it. I did, that it was a promise ring, essentially. So my expectations went through the roof. And then the next time he gave me a gift, it was for Christmas. And it was a camera <laughs> and I thought at the time oh <laughs> uh but he he was thinking I like to take pictures and things like that so it's a nice gift but for me it was impersonal uh so I was disappointed but we've learned a lot since then um, and we tell jokes about, you know, the husband who gives the wife a vacuum or something like that, what not to do. Um, so that doesn't happen anymore. But we still tell jokes about what used to happen. Oh, that, that's great, Carolyn. My first gift from Danielle was a cactus. Now, let's look at that one. Carolyn, I'm also like you. Touch. Um, for various reasons, uh, I needed healing in. And that is actually the bottom of my list of love languages. Um, but Danielle creates an atmosphere for safe. And I'm talking, he creates it in my life, not just moments. So he creates atmospheres because words of affirmation is my second language. So he likes to just flirt with me. That touches my heart even more. Okay. Because this is just words of affirmation. So he's using my love language to reach me. And I remember we used to do uh, kids church. So, you know, we had to look, well, we had to behave. Okay. <laughs> uh, because we do like to flirt with each other. We do. When we're on the dance floor, I love to flirt with my husband. That's just, that's just what I do. So when we were in church, I had dressed up in this dress. Okay. And in this dress, um, we're sitting in church trying to look like Sunday school teachers. Okay. And he leans over to me and he flicks one of my buttons because my buttons happened to be, and Bonnie will post a picture, happens to be a Romy coin. And he says to me, straight face, okay, ran to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar and flicks my button. So I'm trying not to bust out laughing in church, okay? And I mean, it's just going to explode, okay? So um, we're, we're laughing about it. We're enjoying it. <clears throat> so about a couple months later, I wear the dress again. And he looks at me with a wrinkle in his eye and he flicks the button. And I look at him and I go, what are you doing? Looking for loose change? And we so enjoyed it. And this is how we meet each other. So that we feel a safe zone 
and he knows he's speaking my language. Laughter is very much one of my languages, as in like, it's not a love language, but it's what I cope with. So he meets me at that. So Carolyn, I totally understand Dave making a safe space for you and Danielle making a safe space for me. Those are great stories, ladies. <laughs> very good. <laughs> For me, like in most things, I can't narrow down one of the five languages for me. And maybe you're like me, you're confused sometimes because um, I do love aspects of all five of those. In my marriage, Dan, like your husband's, his first um, love language is physical touch. And, um, but we both love words of affirmation and quality time and even acts of service. Um, those will, they all have had impacts in our, in our marriage. But I want to go back to when, um, Dan and I first started dating. Um, we met at a program called Divorce Care that I was facilitating. Um, I had, as you know, from previous um, episodes, I have been divorced and um, I had been about five years on my own living single, but running this divorce care program for other people going through divorce. And Dan was um, newly divorced and came out one time to the program, really thought it was important to share that program with others. And he was um, trying to get it started at his church. So through communication with each other, on that basis, he asked me out for a date. Now, I was very reluctant to have um, a date because of my hurts from my divorce. I was going through healing. I had finally been healed, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to start dating. But anyway, um, after seeking the Lord and after seeking um, wise counsel from dear friends, um, we went out on our first date. And um, when the date was over and he had taken me home and the date was at a church, <laughs> when he took me home at the end of the date, he said to me, he turned to me and said, may I pray for you? And that was the first time a man had ever asked to pray for me. And I melted. And um, that was the first step in our um, relationship. Now, fast forward five months later, he asked me to marry him and um, he did it in such a loving way because he included my son, who was 12 years old at the time, and made sure that he was in on it. And uh, he um, set us up in a restaurant, in his private area of the restaurant. He had a friend ahead of time deliver to the restaurant a gift to me in order to ask me to marry him. And it was a scroll and it, the scroll was huge. And as I unrolled it, it was telling me all the things that he saw in me and appreciated about me and how he wanted me to be his wife. Again, words of affirmation, beautifully um, spoken through this scroll. And um, then when we got married, he had, unknown to me, he took our wedding vows and had them put on parchment paper and then framed. And we have them over our bed right now. So my words to him, the promises I made in our marriage, and his words to me that he promised in our marriage. And whenever we are separated, for instance, if I go on a retreat or if I go down to see family and he's not coming with me, we always have letters that we write to each other and we stick them and hide them into each other's suitcases so that when we're apart, we can read um, a special note from the other one. And so words of affirmation have, even though physical touch is his first one, it's very important to both of us to make sure that we are keeping um, fresh with each other, that we are, I guess it's kind of our way of flirting, Colette, you talked about your way. Ours is through these little notes that we send to each other, whether it's a text or um, one time I hid little notes all through the house 
so that um, he would find them. So if he went to get his cereal bowl in the morning, there'd be a little note, you know, just a sentence or so, or, you know, when he went to his favorite place to sit, he'd find a note. So little creative ways to, to make sure that you're reaching those uh, love languages to your partner. That is so beautiful, Bonnie. Seriously, um, you're you're saying that, and as you just was prompt to share a story, I'm prompt to share a story. Danielle and I did that uh, about sharing notes, and that we do do that too. He went on a retreat for Promise Keepers one time, and I made him a batch of cookies and stuck a note in between the cookies. Yeah, I wrapped it in saran wrap people. It was sanitary, okay? But I stuck a love note in between the cookies, but I wanted him to reach that, like not see it right away in case he, you know, on the way he, he took a cookie. So I figured once he's there, I want him to establish this. Well, unbeknownst to me, they went to New York's Promise Keeper. And by the time they got there, they were starved and they couldn't get anything to eat. And I'm saying they were starved. So I see you see where this is going, okay? However, it gets worse because they ate a couple of cookies and said, yeah, okay, we're, we're done with the cookies. Like we want food. Well, the guys from another town who was at Promise Keeper had extra pizza. So he switched the can for the extra pizza. So when he comes home, I go, so did you find my note? And he's like, what note? And he's like, oh my gosh, I just floated with the wrong guy. That's hilarious. <laughs> In regards to words of affirmation, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And the heart posture behind how you say it. And I've learned this with my husband because we were finishing groceries and he's very much always a gentleman of carrying things in. But the first time I learned this lesson through laughter because I was grabbing all the bags and, you know, trudging through, carrying them in. And my husband says, stop, stop, Colette, you're not a pack horse. You're a thoroughbred. So if I were to say, to a friend, my husband called me a horse. They would have been offended for me, but it was in love. So check the heart posture behind what they're saying. Alette, I think you have another story about when what your husband used to call you when you were first dating too. Could you tell that story? <laughs> when I met Danielle, like I said, he spoke French. I did not. So when we started hanging around together as friends, we had, you know, a few friends hanging around together in that, he got a pet name for me. And the pet name was Colette Mouffette. And I thought I had just got a perm in my hair. And I thought, oh, look, he's calling me a lamb. I went two years through agricultural college thinking my husband was calling me a lamb. Fast forward to Amy going to kindergarten learning French. See how strong my French was? And she comes home with her, her homework. And she says, Mouffette, a skunk. And I went, oh, no, no, baby. It's not a, a skunk. It is a lamb. And she said, no, mommy, it's a skunk. And I said, babe, what is the Mouffette? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a skunk. And I went, excuse me you've been calling me call it Mouffette and it's a skunk I said why would you call me a skunk and he says because it rhymes with Colette and I says so does toilet but I don't want to be called that either again heart posture behind go deeper ladies if you get offended try and figure out exactly what our men are trying to say okay give them grace and love very wise words <laughs> to go back to our childhood to really establish 
what our main love languages is before we learn to adapt. Um, I have a, I know that words of affirmation are extremely important for me. They're life or death. And I know that's for everybody. But if I look at my childhood, I will see where the enemy attacked me the most is usually one of your love languages too. Because I was the kid in the playground that was bullied. No words of affirmation, nothing like that. So where the enemy tried to take me out, God gave me back my assignment of words of affirmation that when I was in Cape Real, when I first moved here, just first married, the Lord said to me, there is a famine in the land of encouragement of words of affirmation. And he was giving me that assignment. And I truly believe that where we've been attacked, look at that and see if that's not part of your love language too. What I was thinking of was that when you talked about uh, if you were hurt as a child, in all likelihood, uh, it had to do with your primary love language. That holds true for me because mine being quality time, my dad's uh, job took him away uh, almost all the time until I was six years old and then half the time after that. And uh, that was... Um, one of the main areas that I needed healing for when I did uh, receive the love of God. Um, it was that sense of um, abandonment. That's what I felt as a child, even though my dad did not uh, intend to send that message. Um as some people say, perception is truth to a child. So as a child, I perceived uh, that my dad uh, did not value spending time with me. He was almost always gone. So that's the message I took in. And it was um, in the primary um, love language, which was quality time for me. And even today, uh, I always have to guard against falling into the ditch of believing that my father, God, you know, um, has time to spend with others. But, uh, you know, do, do you love me, God? Are you wanting to spend time with me? Are you valuing time with me? And that, of course, uh, re reverts back to whatever areas we are hurt in as children, we tend to carry that as baggage um, into relationships when we are older, including uh, relationship with God. So I needed healing there. I received healing, but I also need to maintain that. And, you know, resist falling into the ditch of believing that God is like, you know, my dad when I was little, always gone, you know, not there for me. Not true. That's very deep. Very deep, Carolyn. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people healed by that story that you just shared. This love language stuff works not just with our spouses, but also with our children. And sometimes we can um, misinterpret because we aren't understanding their gifts and the motives behind as we've talked about. So I want to share a couple of stories of um, my son and my husband demonstrating love to me. And at first not understanding myself, the motive behind their love. So um, as I have mentioned before, I believe in one of our episodes, I do have Parkinson's disease. And when I first was diagnosed, my son and my husband, of course, were concerned about me. And one of the big things for Parkinson's is you can um, lose balance or you can get weakened so that falls are a very real thing and the fear of falling. So one Christmas, 
the Christmas after I had had a fall myself and broke my wrist and had a lot of complications come out of that. I call it my dark fall time. This was in 2019. That Christmas, when I opened my gift from my husband and my son, it was an Apple Watch. My very first thought was, how can I use that Apple Watch when I have such a tremor in my hand? I'm not going to be able to look at those buttons, and it was so small, and I thought, why are they giving this to me? I can't use this. And I was a little bit put off at first from the gift, thinking um, this is something I can never learn to use. Well, the motivation behind, especially my son, who is so good at technology, was on the Apple Watch. It has the capability of indicating when you have fallen. It will, it will detect that, and it will send a message to your loved ones if you need assistance. And so that was the great motivator behind my son saying to my husband, we need to get this for her. And so now it's one of my most treasured um, items because I use it all the time. Um, a second thing, so that was in 2019, let's go to the Christmas just past. And I knew the two of them were up to something. They had been communicating behind the scenes. And so the day came for me to open our my gift from the two of them. And it was a cell phone. And I thought, I don't need a cell phone. Like, why am I getting a cell phone? I have a perfectly good cell phone. Well, again, the motivation for my son in the new Apple 14 that just came out um, um, at the end of last year, 2022, it has a capability built in for um, a person to be able to send out an emergency um, call to their loved ones or to their um, to EMS because no matter where you are. So it has the capability of reaching a satellite. It's like a satellite phone that can be used in an emergency. And the motive behind with this was they know that I love to go in the back country on camping trips, kayaking, and often I'm in an area that has no cell service. And as soon as my son found out that the new phone had, the new Apple phone had this capability of being able to use a satellite, they decided that this was something that Bonnie needed so that they could get I could get emergency help and they could be relieved when I was away that I would be able to reach help. So there's a beautiful example of love motive behind a gift. Does that mean we don't have to go to the phone tree anymore when we go camping, Bonnie? <laughs> you better explain that to our viewers. <laughs> Bonnie and I had treated ourselves to our 60th birthday of getting away for a camping week. But we promised, I have no reception at my camp. So we promised our men that we call every second day, our husbands. So um, we affectionately call this the satellite tower kind of um, is going to be great because we have to wait for a signal and we have to drive up the road and near this certain tree you know and we call it our phone tree because we're on the rock and we are doing this and this and this and it's like but it's very important it was very important and we realized that because we did get an sos call we found out we need it to connect so tell them thank you for me bonnie i will <laughs> if you're anything like me a lot of my years, younger years, I was a chameleon. You want me happy, I'm happy. You want me sad, I'm sad. You, Whatever it was, I became. So much so that I lost who I was. And it's just recently that I am 
really embracing who Colette is, who it is. But to be perfectly honest, I was so confused in it. I'm not one for personality tests. That's never been me. But I started doing them. I started doing a few personality tests to see, without me knowing what the answer is, what I am, what I am. And in that, I'm a two on the Enneagram, which is loves to help people. You know, there's certain things that is like, oh, my gosh, I'm a blue on, you know, the blue color code one, which is like relationships are very important to me. If I would have sat there and tried to figure this out, I wouldn't have been able to, to do this. I wouldn't have been. There was even one that I did that it was a color code, literally, like it wasn't the name color code, but it was just colors I got to choose. So I couldn't even control this or make it look like what I want it to. It was just colors that I liked. And sure enough, it came out what my personality was. So maybe, you know, have some fun do a couple of, you know, quizzes. It's not who you are, but it gives you a good guiding light of what's important in your life and what matters to you. Because sometimes we do get lost in all the messages the world gives us. We'll put some of the personality tests that Colette mentioned down in our notes below. Demonstrations of the five love languages can be great healing times in a person's life. And I have such a story of when I received a gift, a totally unexpected gift. My parents divorced when I was about 18 years old. And um, I had some difficulties for uh, quite a while between my dad and I as a result of that. And there were some hurts and things that had happened. My Mom remarried, my dad remarried. So I had a stepfather and I had a stepmother. Fast forward many years and my stepfather, who I adored, he, um, he passed away. About a month later, I received in the mail and so did my sister, a notice of the will. My stepfather, who was quite a bit older than my mom, who had raised four children who were older than my sister and I. Basically, he had to start over again when he married my mom with, you know, early 20-year-old daughters. Well, he, before he passed away, he changed his will so that my sister and I had the same status as his children in receiving an inheritance from him. That was totally, totally unexpected. It was a healing moment because God said, see what the enemy had stolen from you with your own father. He had paid more than full with my stepfather. It was a physical demonstration or manifestation of what God had done through that relationship and through showing me that um, even though I'd had some hurts in my life with my real father, that it was um, demonstrated in my stepfather um, and brought to fruition a love. You need to know that not only was it a happy ending with my stepfather, but it was also a happy ending with my father. Many of those hurts um, have been totally, um, well, first of all, I've totally forgiven. They've been totally healed. I have a wonderful relationship with my father right now. I feel so blessed to have both of those men in my life demonstrating love to me. Um, Yes, it's um, a great to have had two fathers and have a father still in my life. I was thinking as you were sharing that story, Bonnie, about um, and because you talked about that the hurts being healed and you have forgiven. And it reminded me uh, that often 
what we need to, to, to do in order to find the healing that we need is to forgive. And that may be a big challenge because the hurt may be so deep that it will almost feel like some kind of injustice will happen if we forgive. But um, it is so important for us to forgive that I have encouraged others, if it's hard for you to forgive, then ask God to give you grace to forgive and do this. Remove yourself as judge of that person, trusting that God is the best judge, really the only judge. So if you are no longer judging that person and you are trusting God will judge, then you can receive the grace of God to do that. And even that is opening up your heart for healing. But forgiveness is a major key for healing emotionally and often healing physically. Caroline, that is so true that forgiveness needs to flow. In fact, afterwards, I found out that a lot of the reasons that my dad demonstrated some what I thought were unhurtful things to me was out of his um, hurts from the divorce of my parents. So understanding, asking God to give you that enlightenment like Colette did with her mom, just understanding where they're coming from and giving grace to each other to look at that sometimes can be a healing moment also. Um, a benefit of learning the love language is that it can put out fires. <laughs> and what I mean by that is um, years ago, I homeschooled my children. And if anybody's homeschooled, you know, it can be, well, demanding. And I remember just getting to the end of my rope and I said to my husband, okay, take these children and take them for a walk in the bush. Give them a loaf of bread so they can leave a trail back. It'll give me time to have a break. And he went, oh, babe, okay, we are going to go out. <laughs> we are going to go out. And then I hear the bath running and I think, really? And he goes, okay, I just ran a bath for you. You just chill. Okay, honey, just chill. <laughs> he was talking me off the ledge. Okay. And so they went out and I, uh, I, I thought, okay. Nice. So I jump in the back. <laughs> I get this something stick to this my leg, and I want all oh, those kids. They have this stuff in the back, da -da 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 -da. you know. And I'm like, mm, still in that mode, okay. And then I look down, and it was a Ziploc bag with a love letter in it from my husband <laughs> under the bubbles. <laughs> oh, girls from like anger to repentance in a, a split second. Oh God, I don't deserve this family. The whole thing just, you know? So, I mean, to know each other's love language is powerful. And I just loved that my husband did that. And that's an encouraging story. Absolutely, absolutely encouraging. And the lines of words of affirmation too, Again, same season, you know, homeschooling can be very stressful and very, um, the responsibility sometime on your shoulder, if I'm doing enough or whatever, can be very heavy. And I remember going to my husband and going, oh my gosh, like, I don't know if I can do it. I feel like, you know, whatever. And, and I don't know if I have it. And he said the most profound thing to me. He said, oh, honey, it doesn't matter how deep the water gets when you're walking on it. And I thought, oh, my gosh, that's true. It's not about me. It's about trusting, trusting that God will give me and equip me with the things I need. So now when we go through certain things, we just 
go right to let's go water walking. <laughs> and that's our code now between us. You know how, you know, husbands and wives might have codes between us. If you ever hear let's go water walking, that means we're putting our faith in God, not ourselves. I was thinking again, as we were thinking at the beginning of the show and you with tears that for some they don't have someone to leave them love notes um in the cupboard or in with cookies or in the bath and uh they may be feeling sad like they are very much missing out on everything that we are talking about but i also remember from friends who uh, are alone in the sense of relationship wise, but uh, God has spoken to them and said that he loves them, that he is, and I'm thinking of a woman, he is their husband, but it's the same for a man who is alone, that God loves you. I'm speaking to anyone listening and you are alone god loves you so much he is looking out for you he is speaking love to you every day every day he has something to say to you to express his love for you if you will listen like colette talked about with your heart God will speak to you about his love for you. You are special to him. And nobody else will come between his love for you and you. And as we continue on that same thing, Carol Ann, God has written love notes to each of you and they're in the bible and you can pick up that bible and you can read it it's a story of love it's the story of god coming down and loving us and sending his son so reach out you can google favorite love scriptures you can google who i am in christ and you can read those words that are from the pen of god they've been inspired by god and you can find out just how much he loves you. When I was single and um, I really embraced what you were saying, Carol Ann, about God being my husband. And um, we were out, I was out um, going to a conference with some friends. And part of that was being out of town. So of course we were in restaurants going to eat our meals. And so we were out for supper and I was looking over the menu and, you know, often as a single mom, I was, you know, concerned and watching my, my pennies and um, I was looking over and I just felt this beautiful voice, you know, the Holy Spirit speaking to me that um, God, my husband wanted to spoil me and that I could choose whatever I wanted on that menu. And there was something, I don't know what it was, I think maybe shrimp or some kind of meal that I wouldn't normally get. And I just felt that God wanted me to have that special meal, to be delighted in um, being pampered that night. And so I ordered the more expensive meal that I wouldn't normally have because my husband, God, had um, encouraged me to do so. And I was there at that time. And I'll tell you, as much as she enjoyed the shrimp, the love she felt just made her glow. It was amazing to see it in action. I remember when we were watching worship and I heard the Lord say, I love you. But the first time I was watching worship and they were signing mm -hmm. and I saw that God loved me because words were so used to damage me. I didn't trust words for the longest time. So I had to envision. I When I saw them signing worship, I just 
melted. It went inside me that the love of God was real. If you were to ask me the greatest love of my life, I would say God. I could not love my husband the way I wanted to until I learned the love of God in my life first. And that's only been happening for the last three years. I mean, I had taste guys, but I now it's my dwelling place. It's my identity. Something definitely shifted. And I remember saying to God, when you shut down emotionally, you don't pick and choose what you shut down. You don't. You can't just shut down hurts and whatever. All your emotions get shut down. So I was asking the Lord to wake me up, but wake me up first in love so I can love him first and love my husband. But he taught me I have to love him first, then love myself. And then the overflow of that, I will love my husband. And you know what? It worked because what happened was as I went into his presence, I remember getting that love, the feeling of just going right. I remember saying, God, I don't want to go before you. I don't want to go behind you. I just need to be in you. And he said, ah, now you're getting abiding. And it's like, oh my goodness. And a love that flowed into me. Well, that week I was driving by and dropping off the kids, um, my grandkids. And we always blow a kiss and say, hi, pair, love you. As we drive by the French high. But on my way back, I see my husband on the tractor cutting the grass. And I've never felt such a love for him in all my life. It was just like such a love that was almost like a, a good pain. I can't explain it. I've never felt it. And I remember pulling over and praying, God, let him see me. Let him see me so we can connect. And he saw me and he drove over and, you know, got off the tractor. And there was just such a love. I had never experienced with him before and um, we were chatting and I was so enjoying the moment and yeah we kissed goodbye and, and then my second thought is "Ooh, are we allowed to do that I mean he's like at work here you know but I just if you want a deeper love fall in love with the savior first and and receive his love and there's no way you will walk the same there is no way you will love the same and you will be able to see him demonstrating the five love languages in your life because he's complete he will do it through words of affirmation he will do it through gifts he will do it through quality time he will do it through all the love languages so you want to be loved completely go there first and in the overflow, it'll affect you and it'll affect your relationship. What a great summation, Colette. Just beautiful bringing that all together. Perhaps this episode was different from what you expected, but we hope that you will at least um, be encouraged to further pursue the love languages that we have talked about. As we said, most of them will be in the description below. Um, where you can get Gary, Gary Chapman's book, The Five Love Languages. And we should say that he's written books about the five languages of children, and I do believe teenagers as well. And we'll put the quiz that you can find online and find out your own love language. We hope that we have encouraged you to pursue the greatest love, and that is Jesus that God so loved as we started off with this show. God so loved the world that he gave and love gives. And we would like to say and extend a special thank you to you, our viewers. We love hearing from you. We love um, your interaction with us. So if you have a comment or if you would like to write us, you can write us at recoveringyourvoice at gmail.com. And we'd love to hear back from you and respond to you. But till the next episode, we encourage you to keep sharing your stories.
That is beautiful, honey. You were gonna make me cry. <laughs> that wasn't an intro. That was just an no. hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> we're getting serious here, aren't we? <laughs> uh, I wanted to say that for this um, episode, I purposely wore a necklace that was made by Colette and a bracelet that was given to me by Carol Ann because my co-hosts have both demonstrated beautiful love to me as well. Uh, Colette, why don't you stand up and do again the dress? Because I was thinking during the program that we couldn't see the buttons and the full dress and uh, she could put it in the outtakes and it would be funny. Okay, well, before that, you need to see a love gift from Bonnie. When I told her the story, she enjoyed it so much. She gave me jewelry of coins to match. <laughs> so again, love language is demonstrated and entering into my story through this. So let me check in my rules. <laughs> And here is the dress. See the buttons? Looking for loose change. <laughs> Why are you not turning? <laughs> Sorry, it's not turning for me. I see all you guys sideways. Hang on, people. Gravity's kicking in. <laughs> Look at that. Hang on, guys. Spider-Man. Spider-Man. <laughs> Does whatever a spider can. <laughs> See, just turn the camera on, get Colette going, and we got some outtakes to go. <laughs> hey, I bring my own entertainment, okay? <laughs> I am never bored. And guess what? My husband says, oh, sweetie, I'm never bored with you. 